Hex Noir presents Black Moon Cataclysm Chapter 1 December 1st, 1861 7.30 It is Sunday, and the denizens of Fellhaven are slowly waking up to go to work. Workers get dressed and drag themselves to their various industrial occupations across the city. The night watch of the royal guard relinquish their duties to the day watch, slinking back into the shadows after a difficult night. The city is still drenched and half drowned after the heavy rains of the night, and the skies above threaten to finish what they started. 8.15 The sound of rumble ever so gently rolls through the clouds above. Most Felhavians don't even notice, and the ones who do understandably assume it to be thunder. A rare, sensitive few have an uneasy feeling wash over them, as if a foul stench permeated the air suddenly. They do not understand why, for how could they? Their senses had been subdued and repressed their entire lives and they had never encountered something like this before. 8.45 A silent shockwave pulses through the city. Every living being that calls this concrete and metal monstrosity home pauses and looks around, as if someone had just tapped them on the shoulder, as if they had heard or seen something that had alarmed them. But there was nothing. The sensitive few, along with every cat and dog in the city, suddenly feel an impending sense of dread and doom wash over them. Something is not right. For the humans, their logic and reason kick in to tell them that they are just overreacting. Everything is alright. They're just having an off day. The animals, however begin to flee the city en masse. 9.22 Another pulse rolls over the city. Again, the various waking citizens of Fellhaven pause. Something doesn't feel right. Something's not right. But they cannot fathom why they feel so strange. A small portion of the population is screaming in panicked and frantic wails. Their minds are reeling and recoiling from something. Something unnatural and strange is picking at their minds like the whole reality is peeling and pulling away at the fringes. 10.10 10. Another rumble in the clouds. At this point, most of Fellhaven's citizens look up in wonder and confusion. Something's not right here. They can't understand it, but something is horribly wrong. And then they saw it. In the brightening sky above, through the graying and swirling clouds, they saw something descending. A dark sphere with black and striated shell, began to descend upon the city's oldest district of Blackstone. At first, the people stare in wonder, confusion, bewilderment, or simply stunned fear. And then they saw the squirming fleshy tendrils begin to emerge from the Black Moon's underside, and the city became engulfed with screams of terror. 10.11 As the dark satellite descended upon the city, numerous warning sirens began ringing. Sirens that were typically reserved for wartime, which now echoed throughout the entire metropolis. Running for safety, most people of the twisted and winding district of Blackstone ran indoors to hide away from the aberrant threat. As it approached, the mind of every man, woman, and child was now filled with revolting sensations as the veil between the world of the living and the world far beyond grew thinner in its presence. 
The black moon came to rest hovering some 200 feet from the ground, and for one fleeting moment it simply floated there silently and motionlessly. And then it gave an earth-shattering roar, and suddenly a gravitational vortex of about 700 tons crashed down upon the city streets below, and in one cataclysmic instant, seven city blocks were flattened into a massive crater. 10, 12. The impact rocked through the city, shattering windows, fracturing walls, and shaking the very foundation the city rested upon. The buildings in the crater had not only collapsed, crushing and killing most who resided within them, but they had shattered the foundations beneath them and collapsed the various maintenance and sewer tunnels underneath. In only a handful of seconds, about 1,700 souls were crushed between fracturing concrete and brick, and the rest were buried under a mountain of rubble. They had once called home. For but two long minutes, all you could hear throughout the city were the sirens warning of a disaster that was already upon them. Ten fourteen. The fleshy tendrils and appendages of the moon slithered out from its underside and began sifting through the rubble. The horror that had nullified an entire neighborhood in the blink of an eye knew without seeing where every single soul rested. Their flesh and their blood spoke to it in ways that humans could scarcely comprehend. And as it found them, their flesh was joined with it and its power grew. Where previously it had formed its vessel out of the deformed biological matter of 200 souls. Now it feasted upon nearly 2,000 more. Reality began to bend and break in its vicinity. Concrete, brick, and metal twisted and melted as if engulfed by immense heat, and yet there was none. The minds of survivors broke, engulfed with incomprehensible whispers from some eldritch place. And as their minds changed, so did their bodies. A young man fought like hell to pull a neighbor from the wreckage, only to find their neighbor transformed into a twisted beast, frenzied by the moon above. An elderly woman who had miraculously escaped from her collapsing building without a scratch now had her head decapitated by her daughter, who had spent years taking care of her. A child lay crying in fear and pain, encapsulated by the remnants of their home, when the large brick wall that had trapped them was lifted off, only to reveal a writhing mass of tendrils cascading down upon them. The black moon did not discriminate, and it did not sympathize. It could not understand their pain or their horror. It only followed its design. 1020. Blackstone, a district with a long and rich history, fell into chaos. Its winding and crooked streets flooded with fleeing people. Its neglected infrastructure collapsing under the weight of the tragedy that now befell it. And its historical landmarks erased. 1021. Out in the Crimson Bay, the crew of the Imperial warship Paragon's Pride watched in horror at the catastrophe. Battle stations, commanded Admiral Marsters, his collection of medals clinging to his chest as he threw up his hands. Assume battle stations and fire at that monstrosity! The ship's artillery took aim and fired upon the Black Moon. Three shots of the first barrage of cannon fire hit the moon, shattering portions of its dark shell, but two missed their mark, hitting civilian buildings in the process. Up among the slopes of Carthime Rock, the Silver Barons of Eppington and the clergy of Empyrean Heights watched from their high terraces. 
Across the bay in the luxurious Lexingham Gardens, the rare few royal nobles who had woken up during the cannon fire emerged out of their balconies to watch the display, some with genuine horror, although not all fear for the safety of their citizens. The districts that were not graced with proper elevation had no way of seeing the horrors as they unfolded, so most assumed a long brewing civil war had finally broken out, and many people sought to capitalize upon that opportunity. The cannons of Paragon's pride fired again and again, chipping away at the moon's shell as it did. But then, the carrion satellites rose up a hundred or so feet in the air where it hovered. A crimson glow began enveloping its tendrils as the moon seemed to fabricate a gargantuan spear made of bone, veins, and crystallized blood. And then it fired the spear over the rooftops of Blackstone and out into the Crimson Bay, where it found its target, the Imperial ship. Paragon's pride was torn asunder in a flash of red and rapidly sank to the murky depths below. 10.45 David Torben, a father of five, pushed his way through the fleeing crowd, while most ran for their lives away from the impact crater and the black moon that hovered above it, he ran towards it. He had been working over in Howell's End when the moon struck, but his home was in the center of Blackstone, where his children and wife lived. Using his knowledge of the city, he darted into alleyways and shortcuts to escape the crowd, but eventually found himself at the edge of the crater. The neighboring buildings had been severely damaged, but all structures within the crater had been completely flattened. With no heed for his own safety, David ran across the devastation, jumping over collapsed brick walls, bent metal beams, and distorted landscapes. All around him he saw people struggling to survive and others deforming into monstrosities. He felt a terrible presence push into his mind, but his fear and love for his family propelled him forward towards his home, which should be on the far edge of the crater. And soon, as the moon began to descend back down to resume its design, David found what remained of his house. The bodies of hundreds lay fractured and buried in the rubble, his wife and four of his children among them. The man screamed in terror and heartache as he gathered the bodies of his family, cradling their broken remains in his arms. Tears streamed down his face as his entire life became undone, and as the moon continued to consume and integrate and grow behind him through all the rumbling and screams of terror and bloodlust, he heard a cough. Searching through the rubble, pulling away pieces of his home and his past, David soon found the frail form of a little girl with light blonde hair, his daughter, his one remaining child. Kira. 1051. David Torvin fought with everything he had to release his daughter from the wreckage, and soon he held her in his hands. He looked back, and in horror he watched as tendrils crept closer and closer to the position, consuming every frenzied monster and earthly remains they could find. He couldn't let that eldritch horror consume his family, but he had to bring Kira to safety. He couldn't do both, and it broke his heart to make a decision. It was an ultimatum that would break any man. But decide he did, and David gripped Kira in his arms and ran for the edge of the crater. He climbed over the lip of it, pushing Kira ahead of him, and then he felt a terrible pain pierce his leg. He looked back and found one of the tendrils now merging with his foot consuming and integrating his own body into its mass. Kira, run! He called out to his eight-year-old daughter, who just stared in catatonic horror. Run! Suddenly a young man came running out of a nearby alleyway. His skin was tanned and his hair was black, and he wore a blood-stained patience gown, but in his hand he held a large-looking cleaver. 
Saber! <laughs> Saber! David cried out as more and more tendrils consumed him. The young man darted towards the girl and picked her up in one arm. David felt a small smile of relief curl across his lips as he watched the young man pull his daughter away to safety. At least Kira would survive this tragedy. I'm sorry, said the young man as he retreated away from the tendrils and soon David saw a girl emerge from the same alleyway. Her skin was pale and her hair was white and her eyes were covered with a bloody blindfold and yet she still seemed to look in their general direction. David watched as the young man took the girl's hand and then led her and his daughter away from the crater. David felt relief for but a moment, but soon he felt nothing but pain and sorrow as his body was pulled and integrated into the roiling mass of flesh and horror. And as the survivors ran for safety, the black moon had finally eaten its fill and grown about three times its initial size. 10, 54, 54. Tragedy achieved, cataclysm created, the black moon rose into the air. Higher and higher it flew up above the now scarred city of Fellhaven, until it pierced the clouds. Its immense size and gravitational pull parted the dark grey blanket in the sky and the people below could briefly see the bright blue sky above. But then they saw something that had not been seen in centuries. The black moon slowed and soon halted as a fabric of bright and golden latticework materialized. A web that had remained invisible in the upper stratosphere for longer than living memory could recall. And now it bowed and bent to the immense power of the Black Moon. Those who didn't cower in fear watched as the entire sky lit up and was engulfed by this golden wave. And those sensitive few felt that familiar feeling of reality bending yet again as another pulse washed over the world. The black moon glowed with crimson light and soon the fabric of golden light snapped and came undone, its countless threads dissolving and scattering into the astral winds of a much larger universe beyond it. And so the natural order which had repressed and regressed an entire world for four and a half centuries was shattered into nothingness. And as the black moon rose up higher and higher, and ultimately came to rest far above the planet, an even greater change began as old magic seeped back into the world. A dark age had ended, and a new age of wonder and terrors had begun. End of chapter one.